I, I think that um, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the priest to person ratio, priest to lay person ratio in the church, while it has changed and there's, you know, there are less priests, there's also less people practicing the faith. I think that in the 50s, the 1950s, two-thirds of Catholics regularly attended Mass, and today it's one-third. So the number of people that the priests have to minister to has gone down. Um, I am not at all convinced that we have a uh, crisis of shortage of priests in the United States. I think that uh, people, at least in the east of the Mississippi, have no trouble really receiving the sacraments if they want them. Um, you know, I mean, in the end, you have to ask yourself, do you think that there are basic principles involved in priestly celibacy that are spiritually positive and beneficial for the church? And uh, would we, if we traded that good for the good of married priests, uh, also be um, wedding ourselves to a whole new set of social and anthropological difficulties? The truth of the matter is, in our own civic society, there are a lot of instances of crisis in marriage and there's no real uh, naive reason <laughs> it would be naive to think that those problems would not enter into the parish setting if we had married priests um, but I you know I have to tell you from my point of view what I see is a resurgence of young people who are certainly a counterculture and a minority but very interested in the faith I mean from where I'm sitting in my 30s I'm seeing people in their 20s who are very committed, uh, and I don't think we're going in the same direction in terms of secularization as a lot of the European countries. I think that there's a sort of significant, substantial, and very proactive subculture of young Catholics in America. It's kind of encouraging. Well, no, I don't think the I, no, I don't think the standards to, be, to reach the priesthood, the priesthood should be relaxed. The priesthood is a is a mystery of grace. Now, when you talk about grace, you are outside the domain of what we can. Uh, immediately physically demonstrate to exist. But grace is something very real and very concrete that acts in people's lives. And the priesthood is only possible by God's grace. And even with God's grace, it requires a sacred cooperation from a human being. It ennobles the human being if they cooperate faithfully with that vocation. And I would say, you know, although I would say some of the worst people I've met in my life are priests, for the most part, the best people I've met in my life are often Catholic priests and Catholic religious uh, nuns and sisters. It's a very high calling. It's a very difficult calling. But the beauty of it is the, no is, is the nobility. It is the demanding sacrificial aspect. If you take away the sacrifice, I think that you, uh, you take away, in a certain sense, the, the standard to which the human being is called. We're, we're not mediocre beings. I mean, we're made for something very glorious and, and, and very great in the spiritual dimension of ourselves. And I think the priesthood uh, is an attempt to maintain that calling in human existence of radically sacrificial action. That we don't arrive at doing it that well in many cases, uh, well, that's, that's too bad. But in a way, uh, sometimes we do. Sometimes some of them do. But I mean, in any case, it's, it's very important to have the goal. If you lose all idealism, I mean, the world has enough cynicism. We're, not, we're fine at being cynical. We need to tend towards the higher ideal and to be called toward it. No, I don't have stories what I just mean. I, I mean, I'm exaggerating. I say some of the worst people I, I met are priests. But I, what I mean is that uh, maybe I should recharacterize that, you know, saying. But I, I would say this, you know, the human free will is left on a long leash by God. And there's nothing that God uh, has given um, to other human beings that he hasn't given to the priest, including free will. And so, you know, the priest can be lazy. The priest can um, neglect his duties. Uh, the priest is capable of moral compromises. But, you know, our, our society likes to point out the, fail, the, failure, the, the failings of priests. And that's, you know, in some ways that's normal and healthy. And it's a good reminder that we need to um, reform ourselves. Uh, that's fair in a way. But in another sense, it can be a little bit uh, blindsided because... We need to see that there are incredible people in the religious life and the priesthood. Well, I'm a convert, and I was not baptized uh, as a child. I'm from an interreligious background. My father's Jewish. My mother's Presbyterian. And um, I just had religious and philosophical questions in college and just started reading. I mean, I started reading uh, uh, Christian, but also other religious uh, uh, 
theoretical writing, Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, and little by little, I got very interested in Christian theology. And uh, I, I, my personal experience was I was, in the, I was at Brown University, and I was in the basement of the science library one day at the term of some of this period of searching, and I was reading a, a book by a, a theologian, and I suddenly, I think I would say I received the gift of faith. I, I just, I had this very strong sense of the presence of the person of Jesus Christ, and I suddenly knew he was real. And it was very strange because, until that point, it wasn't by. I mean, the question had a, uh, was by no means uh, resolvable for me, and uh, so I sought baptism, and then I spent some years studying early Christianity and the history of Christian thought, and gravitated towards Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm.